Good morning, church. What a blessing to be able to worship with you this morning. What an amazing time of worship. And no matter what is happening in your life this morning, I want you to know God is faithful. God is faithful. We're going to enter into the epistle of John this morning. And before we do, if you bow your hearts in prayer with me. Father God, we come before you and we want to say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Father, for you have loved us with an unfailing love. Father, for you have come after us. Father, for this morning we stand by your grace alone. Father, I pray this morning that you will take this word, open our eyes, open our hearts, stir up things within our heart that have lay dormant. Father, if our love has grown cold this morning, breathe life once again. We believe, O oh Lord, that your word is, is your very being, your very bread unto our soul. Father, so take this word and take it into our heart and nourish and grow and bring life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are in the epistle of John a few, um, almost a month or so ago. We entered into this epistle. It's a small epistle, but it's packed and potent with um with the truths of life, because you, you just need to hit the shops to see that, you know, relationships is something that everyone's wondering about. We've all got problems in relationships. We've all got questions about relationships. And the Apostle of John knew a little bit about it, because he had been a brash, young, unloving man who had come to Christ and walked with him and found something. He had found truth that had changed his life around. Now, nearing the age of 100, John sits down to pen for us the most important things that he has learned. And when it comes to it, he says, dearly beloved, it boils down to this. It boils down to gospel relationships. Your love with him and your love with each other and your relationships with one another. So we are in the epistle of John in chapter 4. The scripture is going to come up on the screen. I want you to read with me aloud in your living room as we stand together and read his word. Let's do a church. Beloved. Let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love of God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. But this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence for that day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he has first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, he hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Deep stuff, deep stuff. And the challenge for me this morning is... I get to talk about a subject that nearly 90% of the songs that you listen to are written about. What is love? What is love? Because John 
says it all boils down to this. Perfect love cast out fear. As he is, so we are in this world. If he loves, so we will love. He says these things. And as we hear it, the danger for us is that we're going to take this word love and we've got all these meanings we've attributed to it. And we're going to understand this word according to how we understand love. But love is not an emotion. It is not what makes us feel good. It is not self-gratification. It is not self-fulfillment. Love is a person. And so to help us understand what John is saying here, and yes, it sounds like John is repeating himself, but you know, if you look at research, it says that we need to hear something five to seven times before we start to understand it. Maybe John knew. But John's trying to drum this in because he needs us to understand that love is a person. And that's why as he is, so we are in this world. And how we understand this person and how we know this person changes the way we understand this scripture. And so to do this, I want to take you to a minor prophet in the Old Testament. I want to take you to um, the the book of Hosea. Now, he's a minor prophet not because he has less to say or because he's less important. He's a minor prophet because it's a small book. Hosea writes in the time of Jeroboam. His um, time of prophecy spans over many kings. But the challenge for Hosea is he's speaking in a time of prosperity, of political and economic prosperity in Israel. And he's saying to them, if you don't turn back to God, you are going to become enslaved by the neighboring nations. Now, when everything's going good, it's a little bit hard to hear this. You see, if things are not working in your life and I say, hey, maybe it's worth changing something, you'll go, well, things are not working. Yeah, maybe it's worth changing something. But if everything's going really well, and like Israel, there is like political peace, there is economic prosperity, you will go, hey, what do you mean? What I'm doing seems to be working for me. And this is the challenge for Hosea, because the time he is speaking into, people can't see any need for change. They can't see what they're doing wrong, because you see the danger of what is happening in the time of Hosea. And we can relate to that. It's not that people had rejected God, that people had taken other things and placed them alongside God. And other things were given the same value and the ability to speak into their lives as God did. So the things that define us can be the, the riches that we have. You know, a time when if I have enough money and if I look good enough, people will like me and I will get places. Thank God we don't live in a time like that, isn't it? So Hosea is asked, and this is something we see in the Old Testament, very often when God calls his prophets, he will tell them to live what they're about to prophesy. And so God tells Hosea in Hosea chapter 1, I want you, Hosea, mind you, Hosea is a man of God. He's a young man and he's a man of God. He loves the Lord. He walks in his ways. He's a good man. And God says to Hosea, I want you to go and take a wife of harlotry. Now, regardless of where you sit on the fence theologically with this, that, that Goma was in harlotry, she was a prostitute at this time, or that she would be a prostitute later on, regardless of where you sit on the fence, the truth is Hosea is marrying into, he is about to enter into a covenant with no way out. A covenant's not a contract, my brothers and sisters. A covenant is death till death do us part. He's about to enter into a covenant with a lady who is not very much a lady at all. One who has given her love for other pleasures. One who has given her love and her body for gifts, for money for wool, for linen, for the things that she could have, the things that she believed she needed. And Hosea is called to go and marry her. And so he goes. And I want you to imagine what it's like, this, this young man, this prophet, enters into this space. 
And he says, I want to marry you. I can only imagine the shock, the astonishment, the amazement. You can't believe it's, it, it's true. Why would something like this happen? And then you enter into that marriage. And then they have three children. The first one's a boy. The second one's a girl. Third one's a boy. By the time the third one comes, God says to Hosea, name him lower me, which means not my people. It gives you a very good indication that the child was not Hosea's. For Gomer had gone back to her old ways. She had gone back to needing more than what she was getting in her marriage. The danger of economic prosperity. And this time is that we believe that love is about meeting my needs. So when Gomer's got, and, and if you've had kids, you kind of can relate to this. When you've got one, two, three kids, you're not sleeping much. You're not feeling very attractive. You're not having those moments where you dazzle your husband. Half of the time, you look like you've been dragged out of something. And so Goma is looking for gratification. And Goma is looking for someone to desire her, to love her. Goma is looking for other things that will give her meaning, give her pleasure, give her satisfaction once again, because she's now lacking it in her marriage. And so Goma finds herself back in her old life, going after things that will give her pleasure. The problem with these things are they're transactional. So there is pleasure for gifts or pleasure for money. But when that pleasure dies, there is shame. And the biggest lie that we fall into in this cycle is that we believe that the very thing that has brought us there is the very thing that will redeem us. So if I will find another man, another love, a greater love, a better gift, a better job, a more, a, 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 a more prosperous um, venture, that my problem will be fixed. And so Gomer is in this cycle and occasionally she comes back home and I want you to see some of the words in the book of Hosea because Hosea says, I will, and God says about the people of um, Israel, I will allure her. When the wife of your youth is going out and coming back smelling like other men, when the wife that you have loved and have three children with is leaving your children behind and going and selling herself, when the people around you know, the people in your village know what your wife is getting up to, the thing in the mind of the Lord is not, I will drag her back, I will take her, I will correct her, I will reject her, I will allure her. The very language speaks of one who is in love. One who is in love. So Hosea goes, he goes to the marketplace. He goes to the place where it's not easy for a man of his stature to go looking for his wife. Because how do you look for someone in the marketplace? You don't just wander around. You ask, have you seen Gomer? Have you seen my wife? I want you to imagine what it feels like for Hosea to enter into that marketplace to ask those questions. In Hosea chapter 3, we see that Gomer stopped coming back home. In fact, she has got herself to a place where those people that promised her much and now have taken much from her, and she is now the property of a man. Very much like sin. See, the pleasures, the, the other things that we, we run after often, they initially, they entice us. They promise us much. But very soon, they own us. The sins of your past or your present, the mistakes that you have done, very often they own you. They own you. They speak to you. 
They have you in chains. And this is how Hosea finds his wife when he goes into the marketplace. I want you to imagine when people were traded and sold. What an unpleasant place it would be because the people that go to buy people for childbearing and other sexual pleasures are not people of good character. I want you to imagine the language in that marketplace as Hosea steps in there. I want you to imagine the, the things that are being spoken about Gomer as she stands there. Now, if in that time and in, in times of slave trade, if you were going to buy a person to perform certain duties, you needed to be able to inspect the goods. You needed to be able to see what you were buying. I want you to imagine what the marketplace was like as people stared and they made assessments of whether she would be any good. And into that space steps in Hosea. Because God has told Hosea in Hosea chapter 3, go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who look to other gods. So Hosea steps into the marketplace and he writes, And so I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and one half homers of barley. And I said to her, I want you to imagine this. He has just gone in to a marketplace and he has purchased what is already his. This is his wife that he is paying for. It is his wife who he has loved and birthed children with that he is setting free. And he used to sit there and, and pay a price for her. And he says he pays this price and then he brings her home. He clothes her. He robes her. She's been stripped. And he robes her. And he says... You shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have any man. So too I will be towards you. What you hear there is a renewing of their vows. For better or worse, for richer or poor, till death do us apart. See the problem for us when we hear the word love is that the word love does not bring the image of what the story that you have just heard. When you hear the word love, you're not thinking of someone like Hosea, who when his wife was unfaithful, not one time, not twice, not thrice, countless times, would go after again and again and again and again when she bore children from that infidelity, that he would bring those children up as his own and forgive again and again and again when she found meaning and value. And the words of those who did not love, mattered more than what he had to say, that he would be patient. When she would come home covered with marks of shame, that he would not look with rejection, but would wash and restore with love. Because they had three children all through that infidelity, he loved her. He loved her. See, when we hear the story, the problem for you and me, my brothers and sisters, is that we don't relate to Gomer. But in this story, there is one hero. Hosea's name means the same as Joshua. It means salvation. Hosea is not you and I. You and I, we are the Goma in this story. We are the Goma in this story. For we were found when we were in sin. 
and we were brought, but somewhere in that, because we did not know the heart of the one who rescued us. Because our hearts were not enamored and taken over but with the love of the one who saved us. We go in search of smaller gods, of little pleasures, of other things that will find, give us meaning. Whether it is a child, whether it's another marriage, whether it's another boyfriend or another boyfriend or a promotion. Or these things that will give us worth and value. We go night after night after night hoping that this one thing will give me this one pleasure, will give me this one meaning, will make my life worth, will give me meaning. Because what am I if I am not loved? But the story, the story is that he came after you and me time after time after time. It was not just the time, you see, when we tell our story, when when we share our testimony, we say, and then God found me, and then we lived happily ever, ever after. But if you and I are honest, if you and I are honest, our stories don't go that way. He found you, he found me, then we came, then we turned away. Then we dabbled with stuff, then we... We sinned without even realizing it. And sometimes we walk too far. And sometimes, like Gomer, we end up in a place that we never thought we would be. Covered in shame. Don't know the way back. How do you come back? The story here is that he came after you. Not with 15 shekels of silver and one and one and a half homers of barley. With the son, with the death of his son, a price was paid. A price was paid. See, when you and I realize that you and I are Gomer, that we are Gomer, when we realize how we have been loved, there is nothing that will lure us out of this love. See, the reason God says, I, you will call me my husband and not my master. See, John says this. John says, perfect love cast out fear. You see, when we first come to God, maybe we love him a little. Maybe we fear him a little. Maybe we obey him because we're worried what will happen if we don't obey him. But I tell you what, perfect love It's not about the fear of the consequences. It is about fear that you will hurt the heart of the one who has done this for you. You will love him because he has loved you with a love that is dazzling. He has loved you with a love that is we are completely unworthy of. He has come after over and over and over again. It's scandalous. It's scandalous has loved you and I this way. And so we venture into the Gospel of John. And when he says, everyone who loves has been born of God, and you will love as he has loved. You will love only if you understand how he has loved. Because if not, you will do what the world does, and you will gratify yourself. You would say things like, I can't forgive them. You don't know what they did. You will feel better than the people around you. You will look at them with condemnation because you feel like you walked in there and God saved you and you got your life together. Why can't other people do it? Because you don't realize how many times you went back. You don't realize in your story how many times you walked away. You don't realize that he came after you. He came after you. There is one hero in yours and my story. There is one prince. There is one king. And that's Jesus. That's Jesus. So when John writes, we love because he loved us first. He's the, what he needs us to grasp is this. If you understand, if you understand, if you could only fathom what was done for you and I. How we have been loved. Then how? then how can we who have been loved this way look at the brother or sister who has harmed us 
Not the way we have. They haven't cheated on us like we have with God. And say, they don't deserve my forgiveness, in fact. In fact, they don't deserve my company or my love or my relationship. We can only do this if we have not understood how we have been loved. We can only do this if we have actually not tasted the depths of the one who has come after us. So this morning, you know, to C.S. Lewis writes this, he says, most people, if they really, really learn to look at their own hearts, would know that they want, and they want acutely, something that cannot be had in this world. And that is why we run after thing, after thing, after sensation, after moment, after high, after things, after situations, anything that will give you a temporary numbing, a temporary pleasure. We run because we know that there is a lack, but it's because we haven't tasted and seen. Because we haven't grasped that you and I, we're Gomer. We're Gomer. And that's why Paul can write, live in the light of this mercy. If you and I live in the light of who we are, that we are the one that has been redeemed, come after, rescued, restored, our scars washed away. Our shame washed away. Our marks covered with the garment of righteousness. In place of the seal of harlotry. A signet ring of love. If we do not know this, we will not walk this. We will have something akin to some false religion, some false love that we profess with our mouths that cost us nothing. A love that cost us nothing is no love at all. Because love cost, it is not about us. Love cost him everything. And so my invitation to you this morning is this. As, we, as we're nearing the end of the epistle of John, I want us to search our hearts. Because whoever lives in love is in God and God is in them. Not the love that the world has, not a love that we have made for ourselves, but in the love of God. I'm going to play a video, and as the video plays, I want us to reflect on where we are in our journey and whether we can relate to this story, because all of us should be able to relate to this story. Take a moment with me as the video plays. Is this love, you ask, as you vow? Till, Till death, death do, do us part. part. I'm complete now, right? That's why it's called your other half. Is this love, you type, trying to find truth on YouTube? Each to their own, after all. You, you do, do you, boo. boo. Is this love, when, when I, I can? can? Convenience is paramount. Loving myself is the mantra you can't live without. Isn't it, you think? Love wasn't in my mother, in my father my brother. I'm, I'm done looking to another to find, find love or a lover. It's, it's my right. It is my right to please me, to be fulfilled. So I'll chase and I'll search for a romance, for a thrill. I can, I can quench, quench this thirst in a bottle or a pill. I am for pleasure. Pleasure is for me. But you've been searching and chasing and running on empty. Is this love going to stick or keep slipping out of your reach? Just need to indulge, indulge a, bit a bit more. He's so handsome and kind. Oh, I can't get her off my mind. She's the one. He's the one. I, I know, know it. It, it just, just feels, feels right. right. But then, shouldn't things be more aligned? I can't handle your flaws. You were meant to fix mine. You said to love and to cherish. You lied. I lied. You said till death to Which part, part do I sign? I just, just need to, to indulge a bit more. It's just a sip for a good time. It's just a sip, so I'm a fun guy. Whoa, a bit more than a sip, but just this one time. It's not enough, I need more high. Escape the lows, I need more high. Escape me, so I'm not I. Why am I myself? Why? No one would notice if I said goodbye. I, I, I just, just need, need to indulge, indulge a bit more. more. I'll deal with it later, I need to unwind. 
Now it's too late to problem solve, it's me time. If I watch long enough, I can focus on their lives, not mine. Mine? Ha, huh, what a joke, what life. Or I'm worth nothing, dead or alive. I've chased desire after desire, left completely unsatisfied. Where is the love in this life? Is this love? No, of course not, because you're asking the wrong question. Love is not an it, but a who. Who is pure perfection? Is this love would never work because when you take away the who, you take away the truth and get all these points of views, which leaves us with who is love. That baby you see on the cars in the shops isn't who you think he is because before he was born, he had always been and still is the king, the creator, your father, your maker. When you asked about love, went on your search and indulged, he was there. Love was, was there. there. Love was waiting for you. Love has been chasing after you since before you were born, calling you mine, giving you life, singing over you every night. You, you are, are not a waste, waste of time. time. You are an intricate design, a masterpiece knitted together, perfect and fine. And when you gave up, love gave up his life, his throne, his glory. He left it all behind for, for you. His love is for you. So the real question is, is this love part of your life? You, you decide. decide. That video, um, the lyrics were written by Andrea and the voices were done by some of the young people in our church family. As we come to a close this morning, the big question is, what will you do with this love? You decide. I want to open an invitation up to you this morning. This is not a religion. This is not a thing that you do. This is not something that you are innately good and pure and your intentions are good. You and I are Gomer. You and I are Gomer. You and I, we run after things that don't give us meaning when the very person that has loved us the most has come after us over and over and over again. And this is where we are this morning. And I want to invite you. I want to invite you to know and to discover the greatest love you have ever known. A love that makes no sense. A scandalous love that the Father has for you. So where you are right now, I want to give you an opportunity to close your eyes and bow your heart. If you could relate to this story, and if you have stepped into relationship with God, but not really known his heart, he's just someone you came to to ask for things. He's just the safe place you come to. But really, the things that give you meaning and pleasure were all these other things you ran after. And when they didn't give you pleasure, you just got more of it and looked for more of it. Today, you might relate to that moment where Hosea finds Gomer in chains because of the choices that you have made. In a place of shame because the very things that promised hope and pleasure have now brought you shame and regret. And if you can relate to this, here's the invitation to you. He has loved you. He has loved you. He doesn't look at you with scorn. He looks at you with love. He wants to renew his covenant with you this morning. He wants to come into your life and restore to you the joy of your salvation that has been lost. He wants to restore to you your identity that has been stolen and marred by the things that you have run after. He wants to restore to you your name, your place, your inheritance for you are his. You are his. You are his. 
open your heart this morning. And if this is you, say, Father, my Lord, my King, I come back this morning. I come back because I am Gomer. I'm Gomer. I didn't even know how much you loved me. I still don't, but I want to know it like this. Who runs after someone who's been unfaithful like this? Who loves like this? I want to know it. I want to know it. Not just because others say it, because I want to know it. Maybe you're a little bit away from there. Maybe you've forgotten that you're Gomer. Maybe you find it hard to love others, to forgive others, because you feel like you're better than them, because you've forgotten that you're Gomer. Come back this morning. You and I, we stand here only by His grace, only because of His love. You and I, we are what we are and who we are because of the price that was paid. We are free because of the price that was paid. Not 15 shekels of silver and one and one and a half homers of barley, but the life of Jesus Christ on the cross. So there was no more blood left till He was disfigured. You and I, we come only by His grace. So this morning, regardless of where you are in the spectrum, my invitation to you, my brother and sister, is please don't settle for less. Because what He has called us to live in is a love like you and I have never known that this world can never give you. No man or woman can ever give you. No child can ever give you. It is a love that is outside this world, literally. So come to the Father this morning. Come to the Father. Come to Him this morning. Let your heart be open. Stand before your King. Stand before your King. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for every person who has opened their heart. Thank you for every person that has come back this morning. Thank you for every heart that you have touched with your love. Thank you for every goma that you have redeemed. Thank you for every goma that you have re-robed and reclothed and resumed and restored. Thank you. We thank you. We thank you. For what love is this? What manner of love is this that you would give your life, not because we were worthy, but you loved us when we were still sinners and ignorant of your love. We thank you for this. We thank you. In Jesus' name, I pray that this has only been the beginning of what you have started walking with him walking in this relationship with him and pursuing this love. I pray that it will be something that you will pursue for the rest of your life.